From behind the headboard slipped a tiny hunter seeker, no more than five centimeters long. Paul recognized it at once, a common assassination weapon that every child of royal blood learned about at an early age. Frank Herbert's universe of Dune presents a unique stage for storytelling as it portrays a highly advanced interstellar society devoid of the typical computing technologies and artificial intelligence found in many other science fiction settings. From the beginning pages of his first novel all the way through the rest of his six-book series, a major theme is present, highlighting humanity's tendency to create technology which it is fundamentally unable to understand or control. While it is initially viewed merely as a common assassination weapon, the tiny device known as a hunter seeker would go on to pose an even greater threat to humanity at large. A danger which left unchecked would ultimately result in the annihilation of all organic life in existence. In this video, I'd like to talk about the established lore of the hunter seeker and how it came to be such a grave universal threat. Spoiler warning as I will be discussing some major events that occur throughout the Dune saga. In Frank Herbert's first novel, Dune, a hunter-seeker is encountered shortly after the Atreides' arrival on Arrakis. Measuring no more than five centimeters, it is described as a ravening sliver of metal which was controlled by a nearby human operator. This tiny device was used to kill its intended target by burrowing into the flesh, chewing its way up nerve channels until it reached the nearest vital organ. The creators of the Hunter Seeker were the Ixians, a society that specialized in the production of complex machinery. Due to the nature of their work, the Ixians often showed a disregard toward the prohibition of the construction of machines made in the likeness of a human mind regularly testing these limits and no doubt in many areas surpassing them as they sought further innovation. In its first appearance in the book, the Hunter Seeker is intended to assassinate Paul Atreides. However, the young ducal heir was well trained in the ways of defense against a potential Hunter Seeker attack. Subsequently, his sharpened observational skills and state of heightened awareness made it possible for him to sense the weapon before it was too late. The Hunter Seeker is usually able to be guided by a human operator through the utilization of a small transmitter eye in conjunction with a handheld Seeker console. However, because Seeker control beams had a limited range, the operator of this deadly weapon would need to be stationed in close proximity. Another limitation in Hunter Seekers was that the vision granted to a user by means of its nose eye was heavily distorted due to the compressed suspensor field which it relied on for mobility. Because of this, any would-be assassin attempting to use a Seeker had to rely on motion in order to identify and close in on a victim. As such, this device would prove far less effective in a crowd and therefore is most commonly activated against isolated targets. Because the bedroom in which it was deployed against Paul was dimly lit, the young Atreides was certain that the operator would be relying heavily on movement to locate him. In defending against a hunter seeker, it is generally understood that personal shields could slow the machine, giving the would-be victim time to destroy the device. Unfortunately, Paul was not wearing his shield at the time, having placed it aside on his bed. Without this common defense, he would need to rely on his wits to overcome this threat. Given his Bene Gesserit training, Paul was able to immobilize and maintain a near catatonic stillness as he watched the deadly device, listening to its faint hum as it navigated around the room. In order to destroy the Seeker, he would need to carefully, quickly, and firmly snatch the weapon out of the air. A challenge in attempting this maneuver stemmed from the fact that the Seeker's suspensor field made the bottom of it slippery and not easy to hold. Before long, a knock sounded on the hallway door behind him before it opened. As the Seeker darted toward the movement, Paul shot his hand out and was able to grab the machine. He heard it hum as it twisted in his hand. He desperately struggled to keep his muscles locked to maintain control of it. He then violently turned and slammed his clenched fist against a metal door plate. Paul felt a crunch as the Seeker's nose eye was smashed and thereafter the device went dead in his hand. To ensure its destruction, he then submerged the deadly sliver in a water fountain. 
While Paul's method of dispatching this weapon was effective, it's quite unlikely that an unconditioned target would have the capability of performing such an agile defensive feat. With the right aim, hunter seekers could also be quickly dispatched by means of a laser gun beam. However, laser guns were rarely used in the Imperium due to their expense and maintenance, as well as the dangers posed by the possibility of the gun's beam coming into contact with an active shield. Throughout the various adaptations of Frank Herbert's novel, the overall design of this device has varied. Although it functioned much the same in David Lynch's 1984 film, the Hunter Seeker had the appearance of a large syringe, which is a pretty significant deviation from its description in the book. The sci-fi miniseries, on the other hand, depicted a much smaller, tadpole-like Hunter Seeker, which was certainly closer to what many readers of Dune imagined when reading the account. The size of the device was much the same in Dune Part 1. However, instead of resembling a silvery tadpole, Villeneuve's adaptation saw the Hunter Seeker take on a much more insectoid appearance. While the Hunter Seeker device was only briefly seen in the Dune Saga, the true and ultimate threat of this weapon was eventually recognized through the prescient visions of the God Emperor Leto II. One of the many calamitous futures which were avoided by his realization of humanity's golden path saw the hunter-seeker's most lethal evolution. Through the development of its machine mind, the Ixians would go on to design an autonomous version of the hunter-seeker with self-improving capabilities. The God Emperor saw that this weapon, if left unchecked, would ultimately search out all organic matter and would subsequently seek to reduce it to an inorganic state. Leto II also saw the danger of this device as a reflection of the threat that the Ixians and those like them tended to pose. He noted that as machine makers, they always ran the risk of becoming totally machine, that is, ultimate sterility. It was inevitable that these self-evolving hunter-seekers would become an uncontrollable danger, and that by the time they met their inevitable end, the human species along with all organic life in the known universe would have been long since extinct as well. The God Emperor's Golden Path saw the elimination of the threat of the hunter-seekers as he painstakingly molded humanity into a species which would be resistant to these kinds of dangerous dependent tendencies. From his efforts sprang a fiercely rebellious, decentralized human race, fostering a deeply ingrained spirit of exploration, independence, and expansion. In a way, Frank Herbert ended up using the Hunter Seeker to further emphasize his thematic warning against humanity's tendency to create and rely on technology which was beyond its ability to understand or control. As is the case with many lessons found in the Dune series, the evolution and ultimate threat of the Hunter Seeker showcases the author's surprisingly accurate observations regarding human nature and his incredible insight into the human condition. But I'm curious to know what you think of the Hunter Seeker. Is there a particular on-screen depiction of this device that you prefer? What lessons do you think can be learned from Paul's first encounter with this device and its foreseen evolution? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy news and lore. Thank you all so much for your support. And as always, have a very nerdy day.